Law exports are partly to blame for the poor balance of payment, which is amplifying the exchange rate problems in Uganda. So coffee subsector pundits believe that given the contribution towards forex earning that coffee used to play, its production stagnation at 3 million bags per annum cannot be underrated as a contributing factor to the shillings woes today. But that's for another day. Coming up on Money Matters, breaking down the presumed impact of rising lending rates, assessing the land policy reform implementation process, and your rights as bank customers as regards interest rates variation. So when the central bank moved up its CBR rate to 14.5 from 13%, commercial banks immediately followed suit, hiking lending rates by an average of 2.5. Today we look at the impact of this development from the point of view of a small-scale industry. All right, John, it's always nice to have you here on NTV. Thank you, Charles. Very good. Um, just briefly looking at what's happening in the economy currently, mm. um, and specifically on the issue of interest rates. We've mm. seen uh, ever since the central bank moved up its benchmark rate, mm. banks immediately increased the lending rates. Mm. Um, how do you look at this situation? Help us or help the viewer out there understand what is exactly happening. Mm. Thank you, Charles. First of all, what we're experiencing is the volatility of the shilling. The shilling is depreciating, and uh, we can attribute this to a number of reasons. Some of them are due to certain inconsistencies within the economy, certain fundamentals that are not right. Some are seasonal, and after some time, they'll wear off. And some are global, and these cannot be controlled by government. I'll start with our global ones. The first issue is that the U.S. economy uh, is growing, it's becoming stronger, and it's becoming attractive for investors. So people who are willing to invest into the Ghanaian economy are now more attracted by the U.S. economy. Moreover, it's a more stable economy, it's a bigger economy, and it promises higher returns. Mm. So naturally, if people are investing away from a country like ours, it means it will affect mm. uh, how many dollars we bring into the country. Mm. And now you have uh, the seasonal issues. You know it's a season of elections and there are people who feel that uh, the government will overspend and they are speculating. Mm. They are keeping their savings in US dollars. And uh, these savings that are being, because if you look at the portfolio now, 43% or slightly over 40% of all savings locally now are in US dollars. Mm. Now, the fundamentals are that uh, our, some of our main export markets in the region are also experiencing challenges. Mm. If you look at the political instability in southern Sudan, the political instability in Burundi, all these are affecting the ability of our traders to export uh, to these markets. In fact, talking about the traders yes. and um, in view of those dynamics, yes. um, what is the situation of the Ugandan manufacturer now? Mm. You know, someone who is manufacturing, operating at maybe a micro, Mm. and a small level, you know, mm. aware of those realities around. What is happening? Ideally, a weak shilling, in fact, should be advantageous for uh, most of our manufacturers. Mm. If, we, we, if we had a competitive uh, manufacturing sector, because just to tell you, uh, we have very few large-scale manufacturers. What we call large-scale manufacturers are simply um, franchises or branches of larger brands, eh? Coca-Cola, Submilla, and so on. So these are not indigenous manufacturers. Because at the end of the day, when they are paying dividends to shareholders, they pay them out in US dollars. So in short, they're actually taking out uh, the hard, currency, the hard currency. But the advantage working small uh, scale manufacturers is that if they make any money, if they export, this money actually comes into the economy. The shareholders are here, the employees are here. The challenge they have now is that uh, uh, the challenges in the business environment that we have always highlighted still exist. Mm. Issues of cost of finance, and I think this situation makes it even worse. In fact, I was going to, to tell you that it brings me back to the first question, yes. or at the point I alluded to in the first question, that you know, when we see interest rates beginning to go up yes. you know, for business loans, actually loans across the board, yes. um, what does that mean to the noble cause of actually making these small manufacturers contribute more to the economy? 
First matter. of all, when interest rates go high, it means that the cost of finance goes high across the board for individuals, for small businesses and larger businesses, particularly for smaller businesses and individuals because these do not have the ability to negotiate with banks. Most banks uh, put a clause within the contract that says that they'll be able to set and change the interest rate based mm. on market conditions to be reflective of the conditions mm. of the market. So this means that when the interest rate goes high, the cost of loans, not only of new loans but existing loans, will automatically go up. People should understand that it's very hard to operate a small industry or small manufacturing entity using personal mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. You have to rely on resources somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that uh, in this year's budget, the government talked about recapitalizing the Uganda Development Bank. But recapitalizing UDB for who? You see, yeah. you, you can recapitalize uh, UDB to serve the already served. Mm. So. What, what we are saying is that how can we expand opportunities mm, to trickle for small down. businesses to trickle down? Because yes. you see, as you tighten, uh, as you raise the CBR, mm. as the central bank raises the CBR, mm. um, uh, in order to stabilize the situation, I think this is a short term measure. I mm. don't consider it to be a long term, long -term solution, solution to, to the that. problem. And indeed, if you look at the stance that the central bank is taking now, mm. it's taking that direction of mm. tightening. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a tight monetary policy, mm -hmm. uh, moving up the CBR rate. Mm -hmm. But from where you sit, mm -hmm. do you think uh, the benefits out of this move, mm -hmm. as it is today, mm -hmm. really outweigh the cost to the economy, especially in view of the fact that, you know, that policy direction mm -hmm. immediately triggers off mm -hmm. uh, a spike in interest rates on the other side? Mm -hmm. Look, we appreciate uh, the actions of the central bank. I think for them, it's part of their overall objective yes. of maintaining macroeconomic stability. stability. So mm. we, we appreciate the actions that they take to ensure there's a certain level of predictability in our economy. Mm. At the same time, we do not want to shoot ourselves in the foot. We don't want to over-tighten to actually make it difficult for businesses to compete, mm. to pay taxes, and to make the economy keep growing. Mm. So we should take what I would call a measured approach as you tighten, what actions are you taking to mitigate that on the private sector side? And we are not asking this of the central bank, but we want to look at government holistically. Mm. We also want to, uh, uh, I think, to ask the Ministry of Finance that, look, central bank is making efforts to stabilize the situation using monetary policy. What should we do in the area mm. of fiscal, fiscal policy, policy and the others? On that note, thank you very much, John. It's been nice talking to you. Thank you so much, Charles. Always good talking to you. The current challenges of certification on land and structure of ownership among the various tenure systems will be ironed out if diversity is considered within the implementation framework of the national land policy. In this edition of Insight, we take a broad look at the national land policy. The framework to effectively operationalize the national land policy is now under review with donors, private sector and civil society actors urging for inclusive implementation. It is good, yes, but you have to plan for the 80 plus percent of these poor Ugandans. Where will you put them? If there was a grand plan to settle, to settle these people, some kind of an urbanization plan whereby you know when you're taking people, they have some sources of employment, they have what, a livelihood outside that land. That would make sense. Among others, it's expected that the immediate single challenge of rising conflict among populations over the resource must be quickly ironed out. Tension between grazing land and agriculture land. Tension between rural development and human settlement, urban settlement. We also have that tension that occurs between um, natural resource management in terms of extraction, the extractive industry, and the claim that human beings have. Government, on the other hand, says that absentee landlords and speculators remain at the center in slowing down commercial reforms around land. Land must be utilized. 
It's not enough to wake up every morning and tell everybody that I've got square miles of land. This land was passed on to me by my great-grandfather. Uh, this is great clan land. It doesn't tell it, not in this modern century. Our problems as a ministry are bound to multiply. If there are people who are prepared to watch and celebrate over the piece of land they have, and they are not utilizing it. But a host of development partners maintain that sorting out governance on land administration, broader documentation and computerization, as well as planning, are key. We are just committing to the next step of engagement. And with it, we want to move with not only the Ministry of Land, but also with the different partners we have within civil society and the academia. The National Land Policy Implementation Secretariat is now rallying for a multi-stakeholder effort in order to realize rapid and transparent ownership and productive utilization of land. We are still preparing to see that we define clearly the roles and responsibilities of each key stakeholder. Because as you may realize, the implementation of the National Land Policy is going to be in phases and the buying in is also categorized for different stakeholder groups. Government also says it's seeking to define areas and models of engagement that are essential in ensuring cost-effective implementation of the national land policy. So this is the era of interest rate hikes by policy and some banks however might start deducting your money without notice even when in agreement with the bank especially when you have a loan. You have the rights. In this segment this week we discuss your rights and around interest rate change and the changes of terms and conditions. If you have a loan with a bank, now is the time to keep your eyes on the money. With banks hell-bent on making sure borrowers don't default, they go into high gear. You might find deductions on your account you do not understand. According to the consumer guidelines of the Bank of Uganda, before any changes are made in the area of interest rates and other things on your loan, you have the right to know. The banks must notify, immediately notify the customers about the change in interest rates on their loans. So uh, the banks have a duty to satisfy everybody that they have notified the customer. Yeah, mere placement of an advert in the papers is not enough to notify all their customers. The bank notifies the customer specifically about their loan and about the interest rate. And in that letter, it will show the effective date. So you have to know, so you are not caught by surprise. Should any issue in disagreement fail to be resolved quickly, you have recourse. There's a system of complaints handling in each bank. At each branch, there's a complaints desk, and uh, that's where the complaints first go. They are given about uh, 21 days within which to resolve those complaints at the bank level. And if that complaint is not resolved, it can be escalated to Bank of Uganda. There is a special email on the Bank of Uganda website, uh, which is used for raising complaints to the Bank of Uganda, or just writing to the Office of the Director of Commercial Banking yeah, to raise a complaint about a particular bank. Whatever happens, keep your eye on the money, follow up all transactions, and exercise your rights. Let us now take you to meet a woman from Bali that has taken value addition to another level, uh, minting money from the traditional delicacy of Malewa or bamboo shoots. And that's coming up in this week's Your Money segment. <laughs> from the bamboo plant comes these shoots, which are food in the eastern part of Uganda specifically the Bogisu sub-region. This was a traditional delicacy and by economic theory could pass for an inferior good until some people started adding value to it 
and in this case, Sarah Veronica. I was creative. I say this marewa has been on the market for so long, but people just eat it locally like that. And I, I say, if I try like this, can this work? So by 2007, I tried, I, I, I tried making marewa. I tried with the family members. When they, they tested the marewa, they said it was good. For sure, malewa can't be a new thing, the way Kabalagalao pancakes isn't. But once value starts to be added, things start to change. My processing is that when I get the malewa, I put in the, I, I get a saucepan, I pour their water, I get a heap, what I'm going to prepare that day, I put in the saucepan, then uh, I put on the fire for, the, for about two hours. When they get ready, I wash them thoroughly well to see that that water, which is the, the smoke and what have you, has gone th to make them clean. I, I can wash about five to so many, so many times, let me say. You see that they are clean, then you, you, what? you put on the, on the sun to dry. If it is the rain season, it takes about tea two weeks but if it is the sunshine it is that season it takes just four days to five days to, they get dry uh, preservation there is what you call local magadi mm -hmm. we, we i put that local magadi so even if it stays for one year even two years it, it doesn't go bad once she decided on processing she had to test the products in the market and that changed everything the first thing, I was taking so many things, but the first thing to get finished was Marewa in Umasho Ground, uh, Kampala, Dosa, 2008, 2009, 2010. Then they opened Eastern, Eastern Show, Isho Ground in Bali. I took there the Marewa and the other things, but the Marewa was the one which was even faster going. Then the packaging had to change. To complete the value addition. By now I'm packing in tins, but those days I started packing in buvera. But when I heard of saying that buvera is not a good thing for the for the environment, then I started getting the tins. I now pack in tins. And sometimes there are those people who go outside. They they have told them that there's a lady who makes who makes packed malaria. They come. Or they ring me and I direct them to, to my shop. They come and I buy and I take them outside. Even in Kampala people, there are those people in Kampala who need this marewa very much. They even ask me, where can we get them? But in Kampala, there's no way I, I don't know where I can yeah. place them. Having realized the commercial nature of malewa, the suppliers are hiking their prices, which is good for the value chain, but a challenge for her. Veronica needs a Kampala based distributor for Malewa and is looking for an investor to join her to upgrade to machinery processing like dryers and others. So if you have a nose for opportunity, here might be one for you. In this week's entrepreneur, Alan Rakatungu, started the company offering digital commerce and digital financial services. He shares with us how this idea was mooted and how it has him involved into a job and enterprise. He gave up on formal employment four years ago in a leading telecom firm to follow his passion in the technology world after seeing an opportunity in digital business services provision. I realized that there was a big need for businesses to collect payments digitally, but they did not have the technical capabilities in-house to do it. So we formed this company to, to fill that gap, to be the technical person who will actually help these other businesses to start, you know, to go digital. Alan did not go into business head-on. He first tried his hand at, among other things, sports baiting business. When we started out, we really focused on, on one use case, and that was the sports baiting with Embed. And uh, we grew that 
uh, over the first year of our operation. We then got some people to come in uh, and put some money in and they've, they've taken that side of the business. We're now back to focusing on helping other businesses do what we did with, with Embed because you know, they, they was, we never had money in the office, we never had any cash in the office. It was totally digital. And every business can be that. Capital intensive as it is, the market was not so welcoming. But having been familiar with the nature of financial solutions technologies, Alan managed to wither this time to get his dream business off the ground. We were called in into my former employees to help them execute some things for them. So we started, uh, you know, doing some some solutions for them, and along the way we've we've acquired a few more clients. Cash flow is very tight; you have to operate with cash upfront, and that sometimes is very difficult. Handling payroll, handling you know buying buying these chips, buying those readers, you need capital. But in our market, where venture capital is very scarce where angels are non-existent, uh, most entrepreneurs will find that you have no option but to, to bootstrap. His future next plan is to enable his farm to optimize the company's numerous platforms in order to get more clients on board and support. So we're currently working on uh, supporting credit cards. Uh, we're currently uh, working on supporting banks through a partnership that I will be telling you about uh, very soon. Um, we're also experimenting with, uh, with Bitcoin. Today, Ireland's firm Intel World International offers a wide range of services, including enabling smart businesses to do digital transactions. And now a look at what's happening in the world of markets. That's it this week on Money Matters. Thank you for watching. You can get back to us on 6565. You can also look for NTV Money Matters on Facebook. Leave your comments and views. Cheers.